wanted to welcome all of you here tonight. I'm Dr. Jody Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist. And one of the things that I get to do is put together these talks and invite uh, speakers such as uh, Dr. Meech here to hopefully amaze and, and uh, enlighten you. Dr. Meech has, uh, did her undergraduate degree at Rice University in Texas. She got earned her PhD at MIT. She's the uh, PI of the Ast NASA Astrobiology Grant at the University of Hawaii. Uh, she is, has been on the COI on several space missions. She'll be talking about those later, I understand. Uh, she's uh, let's see, also interested in archaeoastronomy. Uh, Almost went even worse than archaeobiology, which I was trying to do later earlier. Um, but no, she's interested in archaeoastronomy, and she uh, also is one of her uh, main research interests is where does the Earth's water come from? So uh, let's give her a great big Maui welcome. So can you hear me back there? All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this should be some fun. It's OK to ask questions midstream or save them till the end, because I'm told it doesn't have to end exactly at 59 minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> so what I'd like to do with the sun setting on the screen is let's talk about how many of you actually have seen spectacular comets before? Oh, quite a few. Well, you're atypical because modern man doesn't usually notice the night sky anymore because we have city lights and people just never look up. But if you imagine what it was like thousands of years ago when man was looking up at the night sky, they actually had some really beautiful views, including the Polynesian Islanders. So now imagine what happens when something mars this night sky and you get something that looks like this. Now this is one of the great comets that came by recently. This was Comet McNaught in 2007. So imagine what people's impressions would have been when something like this suddenly appears. And these really bright comets often do suddenly appear because the geometry of them getting close to the Earth occurs pretty quickly. So in fact, comets have not enjoyed a particularly good reputation in the past. Um, if you look up here, this is uh, the Bayou Tapestry. It's a famous historical tapestry that was depicting the Battle of Hastings in 1066 when William the Conqueror overthrew King Harold. And you can see what the culprit was right up there. Halley's Comet was the cause of this terrible disaster. In 1857, here's another woodcut. And you can see what people thought of these uh, comet actually means hairy star, these hairy stars flying through the sky. Another woodcut in the 1600s was actually depicting the burning of a city in the fourth century. So in fact, comets have not enjoyed a particularly good reputation in the past, but it wasn't always terrible. Here are some spectacularly bright comets of the past. You notice Comet Halley is on here three times. We have a few like De Chasseau with six tails, a very beautiful comet when you see from the woodcuts. Donati was listed as one of the most beautiful comets of all time. Um, this particular image I really like. Uh, the wife is pointing out to her <laughs> husband <laughs> that he is looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> So apparently women know more about what to look at in the sky. Huh? <laughs> now this comet I want to mention, this was the great comet of 1882. It was the great September comet. And in fact, very recently, in the last, dec uh, last 10 years or so, a person found in an antique sale a book that had some photographs. And these were the photographs, and they put on the web, which comet is this? And apparently someone recognized the photographic technique and said that type of technique was only done between 1850 and about 1910. So therefore they knew the comet occurred between then. It was apparently in autumn. There's still some leaves, some trees are bare, but it was also still twilight. They said the only comet that it could have been this bright was the great comet in September of 1882. It got within about 1.2 solar radii of the sun, came in on a really elliptical orbit, and it was visible in the daytime. 
um, since many of you I know are amateur astronomers, it likely reached magnitude minus 17 and was visible a degree from the sun in midday. So this was a spectacular comet. So the question is, how often do we get such spectacular things and what has been perceived of them historically? Well, remember, we saw Comet Halley on that list three times, and apparently it has been observed a lot. It's not that spectacular, but sometimes it can be bright. In fact, you see it as early as 164 BC in stone tablets. The Chinese, Korean culture all observed Halley's Comet, and so we know it's been around and observed for at least a couple thousand years. So in fact, how many of these have we been able to see that the average general population would notice? Well, I did a tally of all of the comets that were brighter, brighter than naked eye visibility since about 1577. It's a little harder to go back in the records beyond that. And there were about 95 that could have reached naked eye visibility. But you see there's only 10 or so that got spectacularly bright. In other words, as bright as Jupiter or the full moon. So they don't come very often. And so we're going to talk at the end about this new comet, Ison, and whether or not it may be one of these comets. Right now, the predictions say that it could get as bright as minus 6. So maybe we get something that occurs once every century or so. But let's take a look first into history as to how people figured out what these horrible things were. And in fact, if you look at some of the paperwork, here's a, a pamphlet in 1680, an alarm to Europe about the appearance of a comet. And you say, well, that was in the past. They didn't know any better. Well, in 1910, you see similar things. A great comet rapidly approaching. Will it strike the Earth? Here's the Chicago newspaper. They've got some discussions of science, but down at the bottom, Chicago is terrified. Women are stopping up the doors to keep out cyanide. Well, if you take a, a spectrograph to look at the chemis chemistry of a comet tail, the brightest line that you see is actually cyanide. But that doesn't mean there's a lot of it. It just is really bright. So in fact, even in 1910, people were a little bit worried. Yeah, maybe they should have been, because we certainly have evidence now that things have hit the Earth in the past. Big impact 65 million years ago wiped out the dinosaurs. More recently, in 19, um, oh, sorry, that's 1910, not 1980, <laughs> uh, a big explosion over Siberia that flattened trees and had a blast wave as far as, as London. Yeah? What's the difference between a comet and a meteor? Could they be the same? They could be the same. A comet technically is, in the past, was defined as a dirty snowball in space. Um, an asteroid is something without the ice, just the dust. Although nowadays we see ice on asteroids, comets look like asteroids, so the definitions are blurring. A meteor is once you have a piece of a comet or an asteroid that's actually coming through the atmosphere and you see it burning up. So it could be a piece of a comet, technically. Well, we certainly saw in 1994 that a comet broke apart and smashed into Jupiter's atmosphere, so we saw firsthand that this can happen. And there's an interesting story about Shoemaker-Levy 9. Uh, astronomers watched it break apart due to the tidal stresses from Jupiter. And I had a postdoc at that time, and he used to go down to Chile, and he would buy small Maksutov telescopes made in Russia on the black market, fix them up, bring them back to Hawaii, sell them to all of his friends. And customs, and he, looked, he actually looked somewhat like a terrorist, you know, dark beard, swarthy complexion. Customs caught him one day in Miami, said, wait a minute, you've got six telescopes here. What are you doing with this? He goes, look, I'm an astronomer. This comet broke into 21 pieces. I would need 21 to look at it, <laughs> but I could not carry that many. They said, all right, go ahead. <laughs> but in fact, you know, this is getting blown out of proportions. Is this any worse than the alarm pamphlet from 1680 with people fearing that these things are going to smash into Earth, when in fact, it was we who attacked a comet in 2005? <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit about that. But it wasn't all bad news. And I've cleaned this up because I knew there would be kids here. But actually, what passed as uh, inappropriate cartoons were shown also in 1910 for comets. But you see a lot of good stories about young Hope. You know, this girl was actually selling comet pills to the public to protect them from cyanogen poisoning. But it was going to make a better life for her. So you see some optimism with comets in the 1900s. So when do people sort of look? beyond the fear and start to think about what are these things scientifically. Well, it occurred pretty early. And in fact, it occurred in 1577 with 
actually over a period of about uh, a year or so with Tycho Brahe, the famous astronomer that did his observations naked eye, he decided that comets aren't things floating around in the atmosphere. And he figured this out with a technique of parallax. He said, they aren't moving very much against the background stars, so they must be pretty far away. So that was the first piece of science. The next piece of science with comets comes to good old um, Edmund Halley. He had noticed that there were appearances in the descriptions of three comets that were roughly separated 75 years apart that looked like the same description. So he wondered if this was something going around the sun. But he didn't have the math skills. And so he went to his good friend Isaac Newton and said, hey, can you do these calculations for me? Now, kids, you should pay attention to this. At the time, Newton said, well, I did it a long time ago, and I lost my notes. <laughs> and in fact, what he had done a long time ago was, you know, college, there had been a problem in college. Bubonic plague had broken out. You know, that's nasty when that happens nowadays. So what do you do? You go home, you invent calculus, you do all sorts of physics, you discover gravity. And that's what Newton had done, but he lost his notes. So Halley said, tell you what, I will pay you to do it again. And so that's how Newton's work got published. And so, in fact, they predicted the return in the 1700s, and Halley died just a couple years before then. Now, surprisingly, and it surprises me, the next bit of major science didn't come until 1950, so quite a long period of time. And that's when people started to wonder, what are these things? So Halley and Newton proved that they go around the sun. In fact, there were two fiercely competing theories between Fred Whipple and Ray Littleton. Ray said, it's just a bunch of sand or debris that goes around the sun. And Fred said, no, I, I think it's a dirty snowball. It's got to have a solid body. And they didn't actually prove which was correct until we sent a space mission in 1986. And lo and behold, saw the actual dirty snowball. So then at that point, another scientist wondered, what relation do they have to everything in the solar system? Why should we care about them? So that brings us to the modern picture of comets. Why should we care about them? And in fact, NASA has spent um, probably on the order of a billion dollars sending spacecraft to look at comets in the cheaper, smaller, faster mission category. And the Europeans are spending almost two billion on a mission to go to a comet. And the reason we care is that these represent sort of the archaeological debris, the leftover remnants from our early solar system. And they can tell us clues about how our solar system was put together and how our planets came to be. And most of everything else that we might want to study has been changed since that era. So this is the one thing we can go back to and look at how it all came about. So in that sense, we consider them a Rosetta Stone. It's, it's our evidence from the early solar system. So our, our sun was born probably out of a cloud of gas and dust that looked much like this. This is uh, cold dust. In here, we have some newly formed stars that are starting to light up the dust. As these clouds start to gently contract, they eventually get denser and denser. And in some of the densest parts, the material gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and a young sun is born. And as this is happening, the material around the young sun is starting to flatten down into a flat pancake-like structure with little tiny dust grains orbiting the star. Things that are very close to the star are hot. You get minerals. But once you get very far from the star, it's quite cool, and you can have ices. So we think probably the Earth formed in a region where it was too hot for water, and that comets certainly had to form in the outskirts where it was much colder. Eventually, bigger and bigger things clump together, and you start building up the building blocks for planets. And once Jupiter started to form sort of midway out, it was so big that it started to throw around all the leftover tiny debris. Some of them got thrown into the inner solar system, and then many of them got thrown way out beyond Pluto's orbit today. And we think those leftovers are probably the things we see now as comets. So here's a view of our solar system, sun in the middle. These are the orbits of the giant planets. And we now know there's a vast reservoir of comets that goes out to maybe 100,000 times the Earth-Sun distance. And they're kilometer-sized icy bodies, the leftovers that Jupiter threw out into the outer solar system. Occasionally, we pass close enough to a nearby star that it gives it just a little tiny gravitational push. It flies into the inner solar system, much like the, the bright comets that we'll be talking about. 
And then what happens to it? Well, they're made of largely water ice and dust. When the sunlight hits the icy surface, it warms it up. Now, in the vacuum of space, you can't melt ice. Instead, it turns directly from a solid ice to a gas. And the gravity on these things are so low that the gas is flowing away. If it hits any dust, the dust flows away too. Uh, we've actually captured some of it in Earth atmosphere. And then as the dust flows away, it starts to make the beautiful tails that we see in the reflected sunlight. You actually see two types of tails, a dust tail and a gas tail. And you can always tell them apart. This is a false color image, but the gas tail is usually blue, partly because of the cyanide fluoresces or emits blue light brilliantly. And then we have the dust, which is usually yellow. And then while this is a, a glacier in Iceland, it looks like what I would imagine a comet surface would look like if you could get up close and personal. It will eventually get really black. Now, it's always hard to explain this in Hawaii. If I was on the mainland, you know, when you're outside after a snowstorm and the snow gets old, it gets really dirty. Well, in fact, that's why, because the ices are leaving and you're left with a layer of dust on top. And then eventually, we look at them from Mauna Kea or Haleakala and enjoy what we can detect from the tails. So what happens to a comet as it ages? Well, eventually, a lot of things could happen to it. We've certainly seen several break up. The one that hit Jupiter, this was another one. Um, this is linear in 1999. Some of the dust that comes off from the tail are Earth orbits around the sun and passes through this debris. And that's when we get a meteor shower. So that's often comet debris. We've seen them break apart. But sometimes they can actually leave a beautiful dust pattern in the solar system that we can see as the zodiacal light, if you've ever seen that. You know, many of you may have seen it but not realized it. Because what you have to do, it's right along the zodiac. And so you watch the sunset where the sun went down. And then after twilight is finished, then you will see a faint glow, which is sunlight uh, reflected off of the comet dust. But if you don't know what you're looking for or don't know when twilight ends, you'll just say, oh, it's still twilight. In, in this case, there's city light. This is a beautiful picture of the Milky Way at an observatory, and you can see the zodiacal light and, of course, some city, <coughs> city lights here. Well, these comets can also suffer another fate. And until recently, we didn't think they could ever pass this close to the sun and survive. This was Comet Lovejoy in 2011. This was in December 15th. This comet passed really close to the sun, passed through its atmosphere, and actually briefly survived for a week or so afterwards. And Comet Ison is going to get about this close to the sun. So there's worry, too, that it may not survive. So that's, that's one thing to think about. Well, before we get into some of the exciting bright comets that are coming along, I wanted to share with you some of the stuff that we've learned from space missions and why NASA and the public has spent so much money on going to comets. So let's take a look very briefly at some of the first missions. The very first one was not a US mission. The US kind of were slow in the game. And it was the Europeans that put together a mission to go to Comet Halley. This is the best picture that they got. They got within about 3,000 miles of the comet's solid body, which is called a nucleus. And the basic piece of science that we got, as I mentioned, was they proved it is a solid body. But they also understood that, gee, it's mostly made of water, a little bit of carbon dioxide, dry ice, and a little bit of carbon monoxide, but mostly water. And then the dust isn't just minerals, it's organic compounds. And this is interesting because the ingredients we need for life, water and organic compounds. So maybe it's good if they hit the Earth. <coughs> The next one, finally, the US gets into the game. This was the Deep Space One mission. It went to a comet called Borelli, shown here. And this was really, a, at first, a military mission to test space technology, to test a new type of rocket engine. But they said, you know what? We could actually do some science, too. Do you have anything interesting? So NASA said, sure, let's go to a comet. So they got better detail because they got closer. Now they start to see features on the surface. The next exciting one was launched in 1999 and got there in 2004. This was the Stardust mission. The goal was to actually send up aerogel. This is a type of uh, very low density gas, glass. If you had a cubic meter of aerogel, you wouldn't even know it's there. It's so low density. And the idea is that as it flies through the comet's tail, all the little dust grains enter into it, get trapped. And because it's so low density, they don't heat up and melt. And then you bring it back to Earth. 
which it did successfully. And so one of the cool things that they found out from this mission was, gee, comet dust has seen really high temperatures. And they didn't expect this. They thought comets would have had to have formed out in the cold regions. So this means our solar system in the beginning had a lot of mixing, and we didn't realize that. Now the mission I was, I was a little bit involved with this one, but the big mission I was involved with was deep impact. Let's actually do an experiment with a comet. And because I've got some slides on that, let's just move on to the slides and I'll show you some of the results. The idea here is to have two spacecraft traveling together. It launched in January of 2005, very short flight time, six months. And on July 4th, it was going to crash into the comet. So one day before getting there, the parent spacecraft separates from the impactor. And so you can see here the two are together, and then the impactor has its own navigation, heads towards the comet. The parent spacecraft now changes its direction so that it can be in a position to watch when this thing hits. And it was going to have to watch it fast. It was going to have to only have 15 minutes to watch the impact. And the reason we picked 15 minutes, we said, all right, we've done all the calculations. It should take 15 minutes, no more, to dig this hole. And then we wanted to look inside this hole at what's inside a comet. And the reason we only had 15 was right along here is the comet's orbit. And that's where there might be dust from previous passages. And these things travel fast. They're going at many kilometers a second, so on the order of, oh, 20, 30,000 miles an hour. And if you have a tiny little dust grain hit you at 20 or 30,000 miles an hour, that's a lot of energy. So it had to turn the shields around and face it forward so it couldn't be looking at the comet. So what did we see? And what was my role? Well, I was in charge of planet Earth. You know, I, I love saying that. In fact, <laughs> I got called for jury duty a couple weeks before the event. And I said, this isn't going to work. And so I, I had my line. I was going to say, you can't call me up. I'm in charge of the world. And they'd say, oh, she's got something not quite right. We don't want her. Um, so in fact, the rest of the team was at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You can tell they're all excited. You have mission control. You can watch what the control uh, folks are doing. Whereas I was stuck on Mauna Kea. And what I think was especially interesting was because every single planetary astronomer was on the mountain, the extragalactic astronomers had to lecture people in Waikiki Beach about comets. And I thought this was great. <laughs> 10,000 people showed up for the event. So I was in charge of coordinating the entire world, observing. Um, hence, I was on Mauna Kea. And the cooks really got into it. This was dessert that night, comet busters. Uh, so in fact, my role was to communicate with everyone, make sure everyone knew what was going on. You're typing fast and furious, <laughs> making sure Chile understands what Hawaii's doing, what Arizona's doing, what the Far East is doing. And it was a little frustrating because I couldn't actually go out and watch the event myself. But in the end, it, it did turn out pretty well. I hope you've eaten. So from all of these events, what did we actually learn? Yeah, we certainly saw a spectacular impact on the comet. But in fact, the one thing that failed was that's what it looked like for 45 minutes. We didn't look inside the crater. It took way longer to develop. And that told us something interesting. That meant the comet was really low density, 10 times less than we expected. So that was some cool science. But what have we learned from these missions? Well, every single comet we went to is completely different from every other comet. That's a good thing from a planetary point of view. Gee, we need another mission or two or three or four. Um, we did learn that they're made of mostly water, ice, and dust, um, organics, which is interesting. Um, we also had an idea from the low density that they're really good thermal insulators, which is great. It means if we want to look at the primitive early solar system material, I bet it's still there. So what's next after these guys? Well, NASA got the cheaper, better, faster to extremes. They said, let's reuse the spacecraft. We have two spacecraft that are flying that are perfectly healthy. We've got Stardust. It sent its capsule home, but we've still got the spacecraft out there. And we've got Deep Impact, parent spacecraft. It's flying around. So what are we going to do? Let's make a second mission. They're already in space. Let's see if there's anything that they can go to. So by sheer luck, this one, Stardust, could go back to our deep impact target, and we could finish our science. So I'll talk about that one first. 
But then this one, Deep Impact, originally we were going to go to Comet Botan. There were only two comets we could get to. And they picked this one because it was cheaper. We'd get there sooner. And I remember at the confirmation hearings, the PI got up in front of this really daunting panel and said, don't worry, Karen is in charge of finding it. There will be no trouble. And I thought, oh my god, don't say this. <laughs> you know, those of you that are amateur astronomers know there's things called weather. It doesn't mean that we will definitely find it. And of course, we did not and had to go to our backup target. Well, let's talk about Temple first. And it turns out it was good that we ended up going to the backup target. Well, Stardust Next is the incarnation of this one. We were going to have an encounter with Temple on Valentine's Day. A really fast flyby, again, on the order of 20, 30,000 miles an hour. So you just are whizzing by this thing quickly. And this is a really old spacecraft. Deep Impact took hundreds of thousands of pictures. This one was going to be able to take 72, and that is it. Because it's an old camera, an old computer, not much memory. And we were going to get pretty close, a couple hundred kilometers, and we'd be able to see details you know, on the order of you know, 30 feet or so. We had a challenge. Imagine that this is the comet and this is the crater that we made. We're flying by really fast and this thing rotates in space. <laughs> we want to make sure we fly past the side that has the crater. Well, how do we adjust? You know, we're flying towards it from years out. How do we adjust? Well, we can slow down and speed up, but we did not have much fuel on board. So we had to have another campaign that I had to be in charge of to get everybody in the world to point their telescopes at this comet. And we were going to need to know the rotation period to within a few minutes. And it rotates about every 42 hours. More than that, we discovered after looking at it for 10 years that its rotation rate is changing. It's speeding up. <laughs> Even worse, each perihelion, every time it passes the sun, it changes in a different way. <laughs> We had, you know, with 42 hours, you might want to adjust it by half of that period, 20 hours, but we only had eight hours of fuel on the spacecraft. So we did our best, we made a prediction, and we told them, use all of the fuel. And from an engineering perspective, that made everybody really nervous. So how did we do? Well, in fact, here's the deep impact images. Here's the one from Stardust Next. You know, it's obviously a different view. But these two features that look somewhat like craters, but we don't think they are, are here. So we succeeded in seeing the same side of the comet, and we thought the impact occurred right between these two craters. So the trick is, did we see the crater? Now, we had a couple goals, and of course, we didn't tell NASA the goal was to see the crater because they wouldn't have believed we could do it. So our goal was a little more gentle. Well, we want to see some of the same surface and some of the surface we didn't see before. So let's whip through some of the pictures to see what we saw as we flew past this comet. We have some flat areas in here, a whole bunch of bumps and pits that we don't think are craters. We think this is maybe where the gases come out. And then we saw a lot of the backside, which we had not seen before. So from that point of view, it was a success. The question is, did we see the crater? Well, here's the deep impact image right before the impactor hit. And so the trajectory said, we must have hit right about in here. This is the Stardust Next image, and it's a much poorer image. Remember, it's an old camera. And these lines are just trying to show, draw your eye to show you the same features from one to the next. Now, what's a little bit confusing is the sun is coming from this side and shining in this direction for this mission, but from here, it's shining from this direction. Now, this means the shadows will be in different places. So, everybody see the crater? Well, this was, again, the deep impact image. This was the best they could do with deep impact data, trying to remove all the dust. And you know, nobody believes you could see anything in there. There's just too much dust. So here's the Stardust Next image. The trajectory said the crater should be about here. Our cratering expert was leaping up and down, saying, I see it, I see it. And everyone else is, mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> OK. But in fact, if you sort of outline it a little bit, this was the consensus after months of work as to what the crater looks like. So what did we learn from this? Well, we learned that comets are kind of formed in layers. We didn't expect that. We saw huge changes in the five years between the two missions. We didn't expect that. 
But you know, what's interesting about science is we have a whole bunch of new mysteries. And in fact, the principal investigator says, we have no idea what a typical comet looks like yet. And we have absolutely no idea what a fresh crater looks like because it's subtle. And I think what that means is that the material on a comet is real fluffy. Imagine dropping a rock into fresh powder snow. You're not going to see a real distinct hole there. So this tells us that these things are good insulators and it's real fluffy on the surface. Yeah? How did you conclude there were layers? Well, that one is on here. You can see layers. And if you do all of the geology, these are hundreds of meters high. And if we go back through here, you can see more layers in here this layering, and this, believe it or not, is actually a volcanic flow feature. Yeah, we didn't understand what it was at the time, but then I saw some images at a volcano conference of Mount St. Helens with the eruptions, and it's, it runs down, the ash clouds collapse and run down the hillside, and then at the end, you see things that are kind of dark on the edges. This has a cliff about 30 or 40 feet high at the front, and it looks exactly like volcanic flows, but in this case, it's a small body, and the volcanic magma, if you will, is carbon dioxide. Yeah? How large is this comet? This comet, on average, yeah. you know, it's obviously not a circle. Can you repeat the question oh. for the folks upstairs? The question is, how large is the comet? And it's obviously not a perfect sphere, but the average radius is about three kilometers or so. So, you know, four or five miles in radius. So maybe the size of Honolulu or so. And this is a particularly big one. Not a gigantic one, but bigger than usual. Okay, so we felt this was a complete success. We saw the crater, and the initial mission for Deep Impact was 330 million. These extended missions are on the order of 30 million, so a tenth the cost. So you reuse the spacecraft. Well, what about epoxy? Now, this is using the Deep Impact spacecraft to go to the comet that I didn't lose. And in fact, this one now has a lot of instruments. It's got two cameras in the infrared, optical, it can do chemistry. So we were really excited about this one. So this is going to be a little movie. As this, this is raw data as the spacecraft is flying in. And what it did was fly in and kind of go under the comet and out. So we'll just watch as we fly through here. And what you're going to see, here's the comet nucleus. This one's tiny. It's average radius on the long axis is maybe a quarter of a mile or so, so it's really tiny. And there's a lot of dust in here. So let me just start the movie. It's just very quick. Of course, I'm going to be standing in front here. Now notice you see a lot of shadows and you see a lot of spots here. Over here, that's just uh, bad pixels on the detector. These are not stars. It turned out that all of these things are chunks of ice floating around the nucleus. And it's probably because there's so many jets spitting off material, even on the nighttime side. And we'd never seen that up close on a comet before. And they're so forceful that they're just pushing off huge chunks of ice from the comet nucleus. And what we learned on this one was pretty surprising. We'd always thought that water did everything on the comet, and there were some minor other gases, but not with this one. So what these are, it's a series of pictures, uh, different colors. So the, this one is just the white light picture. This one was looking at the color of light that reflects from dust. And you can see where the jets are at this end. That's where most of the dust is. That makes sense. Here's where the carbon dioxide, the dry ice is coming out. That makes sense. You see dust. Uh, the jets. Here's where water ice was coming, but there's where the water is. So the water wasn't doing any of this. It's the carbon dioxide that's creating all the interesting stuff on this comet. So we think the water just sort of, the vapor comes out everywhere, but it's deep inside that this comet had lots of dry ice effectively. So this says this comet's different. So were there different chemistries in our young solar system? Well, from the ground, we saw some exciting stuff. One of the things, just, you know, you might imagine now, we kind of like to know how fast it rotates. That helps plan the mission. So as soon as we could, we used Hubble Space Telescope and big telescopes on Mauna Kea. And sure enough, you know, when it's tumbling, you get a lot of reflected light here, very little light, a lot of light. So you get this up and down brightness. And it rotated every 16 hours. 
Well, once it got bright enough for smaller telescopes and amateurs to get going, you're no longer seeing the comet nucleus. There's 100,000 kilometers of dust around it. But because they're strong jets, it's like a lawn sprinkler. You see this spiral feature in the dust. So they, too, could get the rotation. They said, well, Karen, you, you got it wrong. I said, I'm pretty sure I did not get it wrong. They said, well, we don't agree. Then as the spacecraft passed, other people said, no, you're all wrong. It's 19 hours. Well, the jets on this thing were acting like little rocket engines, and it's slowing down really fast. So we saw firsthand how the activity can really affect the comet. Now, you may wonder, where's the ice? We'd never seen ice on the surface. These things are supposed to be made of ice. And in fact, looking close up, um, what this is is a false color image. The comet is rotating in a really complicated way. It's rotating this way. It's doing this back and forth, and it's kind of wobbling. So this is the morning sunrise side. And where it's colored blue, they actually had a faint signature of frost in the morning. But in the afternoon side, no water anywhere. So probably when it gets cold at night, some of this water vapor that's around it freezes out on the surface. So here's the comets we visited. This is what they look like from the ground. Beautiful image of Comet Halley from Cerro Tololo in Chile in 1986. That's what it looks like from a spacecraft. So here's the comparison for each of these. What's next? Well, there's a, a big next, and that's the Rosetta mission. The Europeans have decided to spend, this is one of their huge missions. This is what it looks like from the ground. So clearly, if you want to get some science out of it, we need a little bit better capability. So in fact, this is a one to two billion dollar mission. They've, they've really done it right. It's already launched. It's en route to um, Comet churyumov gerasimenko It will get there in about a year. 2014. Now this one, they've got 20 instruments. It's got a lander, it's got an orbiter, and it's going to stay with the comet as it approaches the sun, as the gas starts to come off. It's going to land on the surface, it's going to dig, it's going to do a whole suite of experiments that we can't do flying past it at 30,000 miles an hour. So we'll finally really get at the chemistry and how it's put together. They've even got some radar that will sort of look inside the comet. Well, what after Rosetta? Well, in fact, I'm going to claim that Pluto is not a planet, and it's icy, and it's in the outer solar system, so it's just a big comet. And in fact, the worst audience I ever spoke to was kindergartners, <laughs> because it was shortly after it was demoted to a dwarf planet. And I said, well, yeah, I was actually on that committee. Oh, that's a hostile audience <laughs> with 50 <laughs> kids looking at you. What do you mean you are the one? <laughs> so in fact, it's going to get there in July 2015. It's got a whole suite of sophisticated instruments to look at the surface, to look at its moon Charon, to study the atmosphere. They'll even look for rings around Pluto. So maybe Pluto will have rings. And then eventually it will go beyond Pluto out into the region where we have the cold storage of all these bodies, the so-called Kuiper Belt objects, of which Pluto is just a really big member. And hopefully they'll fly past one of those in the 2016 to 20 time frame. So with this, what have we learned? Well, Epoxy and the other missions have shown us that we can use ground-based science combined with spacecraft to get something about the chemistry and how these things are put together. And the idea is this is telling us about how we built our solar system. But how does this tell us about making worlds that potentially have life? Because that's ultimately one of the things that's interesting. Yeah, we need certain ingredients on Earth for life to have formed. We need water. We need organic compounds for life. So are comets helpful in that sense? Have you ever thought about where we got our water? I mentioned early on that our Earth formed so close to the sun that it was too hot for water ice. And we're not big enough to just catch gas like Jupiter did. So where do you think we got our water? And again, these same kindergartners were really sharp. I asked them, and you know, they raised their hand and said rivers and streams. I said, well, after that. And several of them said, well, you're an astronomer. It absolutely must come from space. And they, they actually got a real sophisticated answer after I helped them just a little bit. So in fact, um, if we look at our solar system, the inner planets are really dry. You know, we know that Mercury is very dry. They've found hints of ice at the poles, even though it's really close to the sun. 
Well, that's probably from comets hitting it, and then the water, when it gets into the cold regions where there's no sunlight, it will freeze out again. Venus, almost a twin in size to the Earth, probably once had water, but it's lost it. It's too hot. Although we look like an oasis in space, we don't actually have that much water. By mass, the oceans are two hundredths of a percent. And if you count what's inside, it's not that much more. And in fact, the geologists don't actually know how much water is inside the Earth. And if you want to know the range in terms of ocean volumes, some people say it might be three ocean volumes. And the others at the extreme say a hundred ocean volumes could be trapped in the minerals in our Earth. So we don't actually know, but either way, it's not very much. The moon is dry, and Mars is almost dry. So where did we get our water? Well, we certainly have a couple of constraints. We know when the solar system formed, because we have meteorites in our collection and we can date them. So four and a half billion years ago. We know when we had water in abundance, because we can look at rocks that require water to form. And that was really fast. That was only uh, about three, four hundred million years, maybe a little bit longer, after the solar system formed. So we got water fast. So somewhere in here, water came. And one really good idea is maybe things that were icy that formed outside got thrown inwards. And we certainly have plenty of evidence of that if you look at Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, and even farther out in the solar system, Mars, you can see evidence of water under the surface from this sort of flow features, and Jupiter's moons. Things have been thrown around a lot. So it seems sensible that maybe something could have delivered water to Earth. But the question is, how much did we need to bring? And where's the evidence? So in fact, this was inspired by kindergartners. After one talk, someone said, how many comets does it take? And I thought, um, <laughs> I should probably know that. So I've now since calculated it. If it's a comet like the Deep Impact Comet, 20 million. Sounds like a lot, but it's not that big a comet. Hale-Bopp that many of you may have seen, only 10,000. Some of these giant ones that are spectacular, maybe less than 100. So there's a wide range, but it doesn't take that many. So what are we going to do about it? Part of the problem is, we need to know answers from geology. We need to know what happened to the water on the Earth. And the other side of it is, have we sampled every bit of water that we can find in the solar system? We've seen meteorites. We've seen comets. We've been to Jupiter satellites. We've been to Saturn satellites. But very recently, within the last decade, a new type of body that has water in it, we think, has been discovered. And these are called main belt comets. You can see here the, the nucleus or the solid body with a long tail stretching out. And these streaks are just stars and galaxies because it was moving fast enough you had to track the telescope. These are in the asteroid belt. They have orbits just like asteroids. And they always have been there. And we never thought asteroids should have much water, but clearly it's got a tail. So the idea is these are too small and faint to look at from Earth. So the idea is, well, obviously this is a good candidate for a mission. So this is one we're trying to develop from the University of Hawaii. And we've called it Proteus, which means um, an ancient god of water. And so the idea is to explore one of these guys, um, use a new type of engine like they use for Deep Impact, uh, I'm sorry, for um, Deep Space One, one of these ion drives, take about six years to get there, and then spend six months watching one of these things and do a real good chemical analysis getting within a kilometer of the surface. You know, it's flying real close to it and sampling the dust and gas to see if this could be a clue to what brought water to Earth. So with all of that, I wanted to share with you some exciting results with potential comets that are coming along. So what are the chances in our lifetime that we'll get to see one of these comets of the century? So I wanted to show this slide again. The statistics of 95 comets show that maybe 10 in the last 300 years or so have been really good. And of course, we would like something like this guy, which rivaled, you know, was brighter than the full moon and was visible with the sun. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of comet Ison. This was discovered in Russia in September of 2012. Even when it was well beyond Jupiter, it was pretty bright, much brighter than most comets. Most comets would need a 10-meter telescope to see them that far out. 
This is a recent picture of it from about six months ago. Ugh, you know, it doesn't look that great, but it's bright. And the reason it looks not so spectacular at that point is the orbit is coming in so steeply that we're just looking right down its tail. So most of the tail is behind it, so we're just not seeing it. But it's pretty bright at this point. Um, right now it's not terribly visible because it's just coming out from solar conjunction, so it will start to become visible in the morning sky, especially in August to September. Um, maybe if it's as bright as predicted, it should be visible with binoculars. To show you what it looks like from space, this is a recent Hubble Space Telescope image of it. And so this scale is probably, you know, if I had shown you this on a computer screen instead of a projector, you see a little wisp of a tail, and that's what we're seeing here. But you can see a big jet forming already. And this is almost, at the time this picture was taken, almost out to the distance of Jupiter. Water shouldn't be doing that there. That probably has to be dry ice, carbon dioxide, or some of these other more exotic ices. Now, in November, it will continue to brighten. It will come to perihelion on November 28th. At that point, our perspective will be terrible because it will be coming around the sun, and we'll be looking at it from this direction. So we won't be able to look at it. But after it passes perihelion through the solar atmosphere, if it survives, um, it could be as bright as the full moon right before it gets there when we just get a little bit of time to look at it. And then December should be really good for observing if it survives this event. So how is it doing? Well, here's what the orbit looks like right now. This is today. So here's the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The comet is coming in on a very elongated uh, elliptical orbit. So it's right here. It's just come inside the orbit of Jupiter, approaching the orbit of Mars. When it gets to perihelion, here's the blow up of that. Here's where the comet will be. The sun is almost hidden, and the Earth is going to be right here. That's why the visibility is so terrible. Now, if we could get to um, Mercury, that would be pretty good. Well, here was the prediction for brightness, and I realize the numbers are tiny. This is from January 2012 through its perihelion. This is brightness along here. And the way they make these curves is they take a few data points as reported by amateur and professional astronomers, and they just draw a curve through them based on the changing Earth-Sun geometry. So they predict how bright it should be. So this was the prediction. One prediction said minus 6, another said minus 12. So here's where it is now. Let's blow up this piece. It's not quite following it right now. It's a little bit fainter. So I don't know what this means. Um, if this were just purely geometry, it should keep going up. This could mean that something like the carbon dioxide is turning off. Um, it's not close enough yet to the sun for the water to start to get really active. It could be that it's just slowed down for a bit, because they may have irregular a patch of this ice, a patch of this ice, so it could change and warm up again and become more spectacular. Now, if it keeps following this curve but is just a little bit low, well, then it'll only be minus 4 or minus 5. That's still pretty good. So these are notoriously unpredictable. We'll just have to see what happens. So that's this comet. This is what the finer charts will look like if we want to look at it in December after perihelion in the morning. Um, east to southeast, it should have, if it survived, a really long tail. So it should be quite spectacular. Now, a little bit later, not too much later, because it's moving so fast and it's going to be moving quite far north, You'll also be able to see it as an evening object. So this is a chart for December 18th, looking west-northwest. And so it will be at an angle to the horizon. But again, equally spectacular. Now, maybe we're living in a very lucky era because it just so happens that a potentially more exciting comet is coming along. Maybe, maybe not for the viewers on Earth, but this one has the potential to hit Mars. So this one was discovered this year in January of 2013. And then the PanSTARRS folks went back and looked at their data and found some earlier observations of it from October. So we had a good orbit on it pretty quickly. And JPL said, uh-oh, <laughs> it's coming pretty close to Mars. So as of the last orbit, which was April 7th, so you know just a couple weeks ago, the prediction was uh, the perihelion is October 19th. 
not the perihelion, the close approach to Mars is October 19th, 2014. And this orbit says it'll get 120,000 kilometers or about 68,000 miles from the surface. You know, that sounds like, phew, that's huge. Well, that's not very huge on the cosmic scale, and that's just a few times the distance of its farthest moon. And these have errors associated with them, which could be as big as that. Right now, they think the probability is only 1 in 120,000. But, you know, if we were living on Mars, I'd like this to be in the tens of millions, or I'd be a little <laughs> bit nervous. Flyby speed, because its orbit is very elongated, is pretty fast. Uh, 56 kilometers a second, or about 125,000 miles an hour. So if it were to hit, we don't know how big it is. There's some predictions that say it's huge, like 50 kilometers. If something like that were to hit Earth at this speed, that would be the end of everything on Earth. So now there's two camps. Some people say, oh, let's hope it hits Mars. We get a crater. We've dug beneath the surface. <laughs> Others say, maybe it'll wipe out all those Mars spacecraft, and there'll be more money for other planetary science. <laughs> Others are saying, oh, no, you don't want that. Mars is special. NASA would just replace all the spacecraft. There will be no money for planetary science. But I think no matter what, those spacecraft on Mars are going to have one heck of a show. It's going to pass um, sunward side of Mars. So it'll be a little bit hard for the Mars spacecraft to see it because it'll be towards the sun. But right now, here's the current orbit for the close approach. Here's Mars orbit. Here's the path of the comet. And it shows them really close to each other. So you know, astronomers may want to be looking at Mars and the comet before, just in case a disaster occurs on Mars with this comet. So in summary, what have we learned about comets from the effective, I added it up, and I've actually got a chart if people are interested, how much each of these missions costs. Um, all of the missions together, all of the comet missions, including the expensive European one, amount to about $4 billion, whereas all of the other missions, it's an order of magnitude, so 500 billion or so, you know, if you take all the Apollo missions, all the giant planet missions. Now, this sounds like a lot of money because most people don't have that kind of money. So when I was trying to work on our Proteus proposal at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I'd often go back to the hotel and just sit in the bar with a drink and work on editing the text, and the bartender would come over and say, oh, that is so cool, and we'd start chatting. And I, she goes, well, I'd support something like that. And I said, well, you know how much it would cost you, an average taxpayer? She goes, no, how much? And I said, $3.25. I said, is it worth it? And while I'm eating dinner, she comes over, slaps down $3.25 <laughs> and says, I'm in. <laughs> now, I did do this at a grade school. And so I said to everyone, what do you think it will cost? And said, there were kids there. So I said, you're going to each have to give up half of this bag of Skittles. They were OK with it. You're going to give up a can of Coke. Then for the teachers, I put a half a cup of Starbucks coffee. Couple hesitant folks, but some <laughs> of the teachers said, you know, I'll chip in for her. And so they were unanimous. <laughs> so what have we learned? These are left over from the solar system. And I really think they're going to give us clues on how we put the solar system together and where we got water and where we got some of the important ingredients for life. Because we've discovered now almost a couple thousand planets around other stars. If there's some strange way that you have to get water to the planet in order for there to be life, maybe we need to have comets around every solar system. So understanding where we got our water is pretty important. They may be the key, but I don't think we're there yet, which is good because we have to have more missions. So in the meantime, I think we should just go out and hopefully enjoy some of the comets of the century. This was Comet Lovejoy in uh, December 2011, right before it went through the solar atmosphere. This, in fact, was a great comet. Um, looking at the brightness, this got to about magnitude minus 3. So we have had the opportunity for great comets in our lifetime. You can see the reflection in the water here. Beautiful comet. And often they pass by so quickly, you may only have a few day interval. Here was the recent comet Pan Stars, which if you tried to look for it, it was a little bit frustrating, but there were actually two comets in the sky at the time, Pan Stars and Comet Lemon, which if you see some astronomical images, it's absolutely spectacular with a tail of gas and dust, uh, looking at them without the uh, writing on here. This was Pan Stars by, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have the credits on this one, someone in the last few weeks as we were fighting 
at Magic Island in, in Honolulu to try and see it through the clouds. Someone got lucky and got a really nice image. And then there's some real pretty pictures of pan stars. And these are actually real. Sometimes the dust sort of segregates into these striations in the tail. There's different particle sizes of dust that the sun's radiation pushes them around. Here's a beautiful image of pan stars with the uh, new moon. And then finally, when I was uh, talking to my students in my astrobiology class, a couple are exchange students from Norway, and they were excited one day. They said, have you seen the latest headlines in the Norwegian newspaper? And I said, well, actually, no, I have not. <laughs> so they shared it with me. And here's some aurora. This is from April, early April. And you can see the comet here and another image with the aurora. So that's where I'd like to head for the next viewing. And maybe if we're lucky, this is what we'll get at Mars. All right, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. The question is, what is the name of the comet that the Europeans will be landing on? It's churyumov gerasimenko <laughs> And I know the uh, Chilean telescope operators are really irritated when we have all these names, and they go, ah, chimichanga. <laughs> yeah? Here's my question. If you have these giant, dirty snowballs sitting out in this hyperbody of the stars, how could a little tug from a distant star send it flying off at 125,000 miles an hour? Well, the question is, if we've got all these cometary bodies in the Kuiper belt very distant from the sun, how could a little tug from a nearby star send it off at 125,000 miles an hour? Well, what you have to realize is that they are already in orbit around the sun at a significantly high velocity. You know, the Earth's orbital velocity, although you don't feel it, is uh, 30 kilometers a second. So that's pretty fast. And, I, you know, it's roughly the equivalent, not quite that high, maybe 70 thousand miles per hour. A comet on a very elongated orbit when it gets to Earth is coming in faster at 42 kilometers a second, so maybe 100,000 miles an hour. The orbital speeds at the Kuiper belt will be much slower, but it doesn't take much of a tiny little push. And what it doesn't, it doesn't send it shooting off at high speed. It just changed the direction of its orbit. And then it's suddenly coming in on an elliptical pass which speeds up as it gets close to the sun. Yeah? How do the brightness predictions for Comet Ison compare to, say, like Bill Dot? The uh, question was, how do the predictions for brightness for Ison compare to Hale Bopp? I don't know. I didn't look at the predictions. You know, anyone that's interested, there's a fabulous website. It's Seichi Yoshida's Bright Comet webpage. And he actually just collects all the observations he can find, and that's where I got those graphs from. So if you just Google that, you can check at any point how the predictions are doing. Um, apparently, there's a question from yes, JD. Yes, a question from upstairs. I'll hand the phone over. It's not going to repeat <laughs> it. <laughs> Hello? OK. Jeff is transmitting the question to us. No questions. OK. OK. So question in front here. That's a good question. It's how many small comets would it take to get all the water on Earth? The smallest comet I had in my table was Temple, and that's about um, five kilometers or five miles across. So small comets, the smallest, are perhaps half a mile across. So it would take probably 100 million of them. And there's probably more small comets than there are big comets. So way out here in the glass. Two good questions. One is, um, well, the second one let me take first because I've already forgotten the first one. <laughs> Sorry. 
note to speaker, don't do two questions at once. So the second one was, um, is there any way to look at the isotopes to tell where the water comes from? And the answer is yes. And that's basically for us to figure out, did the water form at Earth or did it come from elsewhere? We're looking at the chemical fingerprint, basically a version of heavy water versus light water, because Earth's oceans have more heavy water than we expect from just gases in the solar system. So something made the water a little bit heavier. And we think that something may be comets, because the few that we've looked at have extra heavy water. And in fact, I just remember you said, were there more or different comets in the early solar system? More in the early. Solar. More in the early. Yes, there probably were more in the early solar system, because part of the finishing up of making the solar system was sweeping up all the leftover debris, kicking some of it into the outer solar system, and then some of it just crashed onto the, the young planets. So absolutely, there were more comets in the early solar system. Yeah? Is the Kuiper belt something that we know exists or something that we possibly are postulating? We, uh, the question is, is the Kuiper belt something we know exists or just uh, postulate? We know it exists. Um, the various pieces have been observed. I don't know how many have been observed, but they've observed at least a thousand Kuiper Belt objects. Now the Oort cloud, which is much further, maybe a hundred thousand times the Earth-Sun distance, is just a theory. And it must be there because it sends things in, and we will never be able to observe it. Things are too faint that far out. There's a question out here. The The, the question is, she thought that Earth's water came from the initial accretion and then outgassed, and is that still a possibility? Well, we think there's three possibilities. One, comets or icy bodies from far out could have hit the Earth and brought it. Some people think, well, just because it was so hot that we didn't get ice where Earth formed, there was still water gas, and maybe it just stuck to the dust. And so people have tried to simulate this in the laboratory, and we think you could get an ocean worth, but that's not enough. We don't think that's enough by a long shot. And then some Japanese scientists say, well, wait a minute. At one point, Earth's surface was completely melted. It had an ocean of lava. If you had hydrogen gas around, it will chemically combine with the oxygen in the, the molten rocks and make water. But we don't think that's enough either. And believe it or not, those young kindergartners, when I finally prompted them where did the water came from, they got all three of those answers. They didn't use the same vocabulary, but they got those answers. So I was really impressed. <laughs> uh, let me see if there's someone different, and then I'll get to you. Yep? Uh, if this comet is constantly emitting ice particles, uh, is it, can you estimate the life expectancy of the comets there, the size of their being? Of the yeah, that's it, what really surprised. Well, I'm sorry, the question was, since a comet is constantly emitting stuff, can you estimate the lifetime? And if you calculate how much water comes off each time it goes around the sun, you say, okay, it has to lose about a meter every time. And so when we saw Temple with deep impact and then came back, you probably didn't notice it because you haven't studied the pictures for hours, but they looked remarkably the same. And I said, wait a minute, if it loses that much, it should look completely different. But apparently it loses it in specific places, not everywhere. So you could calculate the lifetime as being a few thousand orbits. And so if an orbit is five years, you know, that's not very long. But we don't know if it gets such a thick dust layer that's really insulating that it protects the ice from beneath and no longer evaporates. And then it will look just like an asteroid. So we don't actually know. One down here. The question is, was I saying Pluto is just possibly just a comet? Well, I'm sure most of the scientific world would disagree with me. It's a round body, but it has been declared by the International Astronomical Union to no longer be a planet because it is so much smaller 
than everything out there. And by definition, a planet has to be on its own orbit around the sun and has to be big enough that it gravitationally dominates everything in its neighborhood. And Pluto does not. And there's a bunch of things beyond Pluto in the Kuiper belt that are actually bigger than Pluto. So in fact, I think Kuiper belt objects are just really big comets. And they probably broke apart and have made some of our comets. So in that sense, yes, I think Pluto is a comet. It will behave a bit differently because it has some gravity. Um, so it will form an atmosphere, whereas comets, their gravity is too light to hold on to the gas. It just flows away. So it will behave differently, but in some sense, it's just nomenclature. And people that are so upset about Pluto not being a planet, I say, you know what? The sun used to be a planet until they decided that we weren't actually at the center of the solar system. We changed its name, and the world didn't end. So if Pluto is no longer called a planet, I think we're OK. Yeah? Because there's a lot of chemistry that occurs in space that creates these organics. And the surf, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Why would there be organics on a comet where you don't hear about them on the moon or Mars? Um, it, there's a lot of chemical processes that will create these organic compounds. And then a comet is constantly renewing its surface. So anything that sits in space unprotected for very long the ultraviolet radiation from the sun and the charged particles will break apart organic compounds and destroy them. And that's probably why we don't see them on Mars. Mars' atmosphere is really thin. Oz um, there's no ozone. Ultraviolet gets to the surface and breaks apart things. But you don't have to be very deep. And then it will be protected. The same with the moon. Um, although the moon, by, vir by virtue of its very violent formation, that may have ruined its organic compounds in the beginning. Let me see if I can get some different folks. OK, so if you're, <coughs> sorry. If you're talking about Pluto you know, technically being a comet, um, mm -hmm. if by definition being a celestial body itself, would that mean that it would still be a comet, but under definition produce, like, if, a co if like, pieces broke off, those be considered comets, and then it be considered something else? Or you know, how does the definition of uh, he's asking about the definition of a comet. If I'm calling Pluto a comet, if pieces broke off of it, would those be comets? How does the definition work? Um, a comet, by definition, is a body that has ice and dust that will outgas when sunlight warms its surface and it forms a tail. Um, so anything that does that, in my book, is going to be called a comet. Pluto probably technically would not be because it is big enough that when it outgasses, they think its atmosphere sometimes collapses and sometimes reforms when it gets warmer. And so that's very different from a normal planet. But it's probably got enough gravity that you don't see a tail streaming behind it. So in that sense, it's a little bit different. OK? Might there be enough of the dirty snowball that you could terraform Mars with water? Question is, are there enough dirty snowballs to terraform Mars with water? And in fact, that is one of the, there's several ways people have postulated. You know, Mars' atmosphere is about 6 1,000th the pressure of ours. It's mostly um, carbon dioxide, so it's not so useful for us to breathe. Um, tiny little bit of nitrogen. One of the ideas to terraform it is we have to increase the gas on Mars. So throw a bunch of comets at it. They will vaporize, and all that gas will be in the atmosphere. Um, ideally, you'd like to put a greenhouse gas, something that will trap the heat. So one idea is throwing comets. Another idea is to manufacture greenhouse gas using chlorine from Mars and methane. And that would be a real strong greenhouse gas and trap the heat. And another idea is to put humongous giant mirrors in orbit to focus <laughs> sunlight on the surface <laughs> and warm up the water that must still be there. So there's some interesting ideas, but there's also ethical issues what if there's subsurface life on Mars? Do we have a right to change that world and ruin it for them? Yeah? When and where do you have to see aurora uh, in Norway? Do you have to go to Oslo, or you want to go up to Tromsø in the Arctic Circle? So when and where about seeing tr uh, aurora in Norway? Well, seeing aurora, you need to be there when there's darkness. It, it occurs all year round, but you can only see it when the sky's dark. Um, 
I know the auroral oval moves around, so you, they, there's predictions on the website to where the oval is. And I, I ran a workshop in Iceland a couple of years ago in September, and the oval was moving over Iceland, and we got the privilege of going outside and seeing it, but it wasn't there every day. So I can't tell you off the top of my head, but there's, I'm sure if you just Google it on the web, you'll find uh, places that describe when and where you can see the aurora. I'm not going to be there until June. June won't work. Yeah, It'll be daylight. Yeah. 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 Any other? Oh, yes. Um, what's the biggest comet that you've like seen with your own eye? Question is, what's the biggest comet I've seen with my own <laughs> eye? And that would have to be Halley's Comet. No, actually, it's not Halley's Comet. I did see Halley's Comet. That's when I was in graduate school doing my thesis. Um, that one is approximately 10 miles across. Hale Bop, I saw with my naked eye, and that one is about 60 miles across. So it's it's the biggest I've seen. Yeah. The question is, how complex are the organics found on comets so far? Um, right now, they're fairly simple. You've got um, formaldehyde, you've got methanol, methane, ethane, acetylene, um, mostly compounds that have six, seven, or eight molecules. They may be more complicated, but you know they're coming off the surface pretty fast, and they may break apart. So I think. You will get that answer once the Rosetta spacecraft lands and can actually do measurements right there. Yep. Uh, would, would the Rosetta like chemical experiments that are uh, being done, would, that, would they be able to detect the really complex things like RNA or DNA, things that would be necessary to, for life to have been communicated from elsewhere? The question is, would the Rosetta spacecraft be able to detect RNA and DNA? I don't know. They've got a mass spectrometer on there, which technically can tell you the atomic weight of whatever goes in, but I don't know what the upper end, and you know, RNA and DNA is so heavy, I don't know what the capabilities of their, their instruments are. Atomic mass spectrometer, time of flight. But that's the one instrument. They've got 20 on there, and I'm, I'm not familiar with everything. Thanks. Any other questions that I'm missing? Forget, I don't usually look at the floor for <laughs> questions. <laughs> people want to see the cost of all these missions. That was so enjoyable. Well, Thank good. you so much. I'm Jan. I'm the secretary.